I know I like to either put an inspirational quote or a uh, a little cartoon or comic up on this slide too. So I thought this one was fun because it gets to really the heart of I think what we're going to hear about today and how we can uncomplicate things uh, to work better uh, together. So I am excited to introduce Scott Bergmeier and Joe Walters. Scott um, is somebody who I have heard of many times. I <clears throat> participated in an extreme facilitation workshop a couple years ago. And Scott was this legendary person who almost everybody else in the group had a relationship with. And so really excited to engage with him and bring him um, into the circle today. And then Joe Walters uh, is director of analytics at On With Life. Um, welcome, Joe. And I, I am really excited about this presentation because um, when we have been having one-on-one -on -one conversations with nonprofit leaders around, you know, the how they've been rethinking and, and reimagining and responding in light of the pandemic, really consistently we've been hearing organizational leaders talk about pulling to the core of what they do and being really intentional during this time. Um, we were pleased to provide On With Life with an adaptation grant last year around reimagining a process. Um, and uh, I think that's what we're gonna hear a little bit more about today. Uh, we will be uh, offering an opportunity for some enhanced Q&A after the presentation. And then we're also holding space for breakouts if folks are interested in doing that. So we'll have Scott and Joe stay in the main room together, um, but you can absolutely use the second half to connect with colleagues who you aren't able to see in person if that is your preference. So let's get into it. And I do have to apologize, Scott and Joe. I don't know. I was trying to pull your slides over last night and the formatting was getting all weird. And so I just like snipped them and then like pasted them. So they're a little smaller, <laughs> but they retain your beautiful formatting. So <laughs> that was my goal. Let's, let's go to the next slide and Barb's running slides for us. So you can just let her know when you're ready to move on. All right, sounds great. Well, good morning, everyone. Barb, you can go to the next slide. We're, I think, uh, and Brianne did a nice job saying hello. That's who I am. I know this is recorded. Um, I, I usually don't talk about myself. I do think it's funny that Brianne heard all about me and she's still connected with me. So that that's kind of, it sounds like whoever she heard about didn't tell maybe the whole truth. Um, but I, I lead uh, two companies in Iowa. One is Creative Solutions Group and one is IQC. IQC is a nonprofit um, like many of you. And so we, uh, in both instances, we're really focused on partnering and working with organizations to move and, and be on the journey towards excellence. And so if you, Barb, you wanna to flip to the next slide. And as we, when we talk about this difference between performance improvement and performance excellence. So I think a lot of times people use those ter that terminology together. And many times when we think about performance improvement, we think about methodologies like Lean Six Sigma, process improvement, continuous improvement, Lean Six Sigma, there's, uh, if you Google search, um, continuous improvement, uh, you find millions and millions of results and tons and tons of different methods. And typically they are usually process focused. So it's, a, it's actually very similar to the, the comic that Brienne had on that first slide. Hey, work is so complicated. It's difficult. Uh, well, I'm too busy to fix it. So I'm just going to keep doing it and hope that I get a different result. So this is a great place to, to leverage performance improvement to say, how do I get better in this individual process? I can elevate that and do it differently across many processes. Uh, next, next slide, please. The difference when we talk about performance excellence compared to performance improvement. Performance excellence is typically organizationally focused. It's really looking at how do we impact all stakeholders, employees, the board, the people we serve, our partners, et cetera. And there's elements of process improvement. So that's one of the things people say, well, I really can't do performance excellence without process improvement. There's organizational and personal learning. There's some element of strategy of leadership and a bunch more. 
So a lot of times when we're talking with organizations and they and you're looking at how do we reimagine or how do we do something different or how do we get better at what we're doing? There's this conversation and decision that we have to make is, do we wanna go down the path of process improvement or performance excellence? They aren't necessarily different. Most organizations start by doing something in process improvement or performance improvement. And then typically it's like, oh, we want to take it to the next level. So if you go to the next slide, what we really kind of look at to demystify this idea of performance excellence is five generally general steps. So it's who are, who are our customers or who are the people we serve and what are the processes? How do we serve them? Then we get process consistent. So we do that consistently and effectively. We measure that. And then we say, how does that compare to others? Either others who do similar work in the state, out of the state, um, in, our, in our region. Um, that may be organizations that are similar to you or different. And we'll talk about that here in a second. And then we make the process better. So that is how, then how we embed performance improvement. The challenge with performance excellence is, okay, there's those five steps. That sounds really straightforward. Now you do that in everything. You do that in how you handle your people process. How do you hire and, and promote and engage them? How do you go and serve your, the, the people or the organizations that you serve in a better and more effective way? How do you execute your strategy or how do you make your strategy? And you're doing those five steps for everything you do. So you can then see how, oh, this is gonna lead into performance improvement because you're gonna say, oh, hey, man, I sh we don't do so good at, at implementing our strategy. Let's do some performance improvement on how do we do that better or more effectively. And then you're always coming back to measure. So organize, many times when you're measuring that process or measuring the output of that, and you're comparing those results to others, that first level is usually you're gonna say, oh, who's like us and who am I gonna compare to? Then at some point you're gonna say, wow, we're performing as, as well as them or better. Now, who can I perform, who can I measure or compare against that is best of the best? So as an example, um, work with an organization and, and they deliver, they, they do some uh, logistics and they're performing um, better than their competitors. And they're like, okay, we're good, we're done. Well, no, compare yourself to Amazon. Are you performing better than Amazon? And if the answer is no, now you have a decision. Is that something you should do better? Is that going to help your business? Is that going to help your organization? So that's really the, the, the lens we want to look at when we're thinking about performance excellence. I do believe it's really important to say, it's not saying you have to do performance excellence or you have to do performance improvement. It's just where do you want to start and what's going to give you the most uh, impact for your organization? So I think Joe is next, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Perfect. And I just wanted to pop in and say, like I love the Amazon example and sometimes in the nonprofit sector, you know, we, we don't necessarily see the parallels between the process improvement that corporations might engage in and how we serve our clients. But what I love about what Joe's about to share is, really how this can be embraced in the sector. And, and I think healthcare and the health uh, uh, field of interest is a little bit maybe further along, but I'm hearing this from a, a lot of folks who have a desire to do this work, but not necessarily the framework. So Joe, I'll let you kind of lead in. And you worked with Scott on this project, um, which I didn't know when I approached each of you. <laughs> so that was serendipitous. So yes, I'll, I'll I, let you uh, I, jump in. Thanks, Brianne. And thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, so good morning, everyone. Happy to be here to share our work. Um, Barb, if you could go to the next slide. To kind of set the stage uh, for where we started our, our kind of 
you know, journey to process or performance excellence. Uh, On With Life is located in Ankeny, Iowa, and, and we were founded 30 years ago by some founding families who had uh, adult children who had sustained a brain injury. And at that time, those families were faced with not very good options for the care of their loved ones. Most of it was just put them in a nursing home. And that was where they're going to spend the rest of their life. And what these families did was they went out and got resources and they got funding. And then they were able to provide therapies to their loved ones. That way they could get back to the maximum or the best quality of life uh, possible. And, and so that was where On With Life was founded. Uh, today, we, we serve a wide variety of um, brain injury uh, rehab from an acute, uh, excuse me, inpatient uh, rehab center here in Ankeny. We have 28 beds, and then we also have a variety of outpatient and residential services. Uh, Barbie, if you go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, what we were finding is over those 30 years, a lot of the processes that we had developed uh, were just developed by whatever it took to get the job done, right? Scott talked about focusing on the customer. And really, that's what this culture has been about. It's about that clinical excellence, doing what it takes. And, and the downside of that has been it's actually been at the cost of some of the development of good, sustainable processes. And so Gene here, pictured on the slide, is our CEO. And about a year ago, uh, we were kind of in that, you know, we, were, we saw COVID coming, um, but we were struggling with some of our processes in our different areas to really grow them in a way that was gonna allow them to, you know, build capacity. In healthcare, there's always new challenges coming at us. There's more reporting requirements. You hear a lot about the, the, the focus on improving quality while reducing costs. I mean, that's it's a huge topic. And we would try these little processes, you know, try to make improvements, but everybody's so busy, those, those gains never took, and they were a challenge to do that. So what we did was we really needed to kind of step back and, and you know, when COVID hit, it just, you know, the pain just ma got magnified two to three times. Um, so, so we started talking about how do we kind of re regroup and really take a systematic approach to this. And so that's where, you know, working with Scott, we, we reached out to Scott and we said, okay, you know, how can we do this in a repeatable format? Because we can't just do lean one time and be done with it. And we also found we needed to re-engage our leadership team because, you know, they were all like, well, the solution to this problem is we just need to add another FTE. Well, that's not sustainable. And I think everybody in this group would probably say we're all being asked to do more with less. So, so what we did was we, we worked with Scott. We developed a, a methodology here. I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, we call it the brain framework um, because it really relates to the, the brain um, injury population that we serve. Um, and we, we first started with our leadership team. We, we took them out for a day um, and did some training with them and, and said, what is lean and what does this mean to you? And then we said, okay, what are we trying to get to and level set that with them. And then we ran them through some uh, scenarios with them just so they could understand what is this process going to be like so that they would become the biggest cheerleaders for our staff. Uh, in doing that, um, we, we, we could have started anywhere. Uh, I think you could start in any organization, you find a hundred processes that you could focus in on. Our key one that was really our, our, our core one that was hurting us uh, and COVID just made this even worse. Uh, was our admissions to the inpatient rehab uh, unit here in Ankeny. Uh, our, when we kind of compared ourselves to external benchmarks, like Scott was saying, our, our, the time it took us to admit one person served uh, was about twice the benchmark. Um, and, and there's a lot of good reasons for that. A lot of, you know, things that we, we made sure everything was done, but it just took that much time. And when, we were, when you're turning, you know, your admissions are getting turned over and we had a lot of, you know, uh, stops and starts with our admissions during COVID, it, it really pressed uh, a lot of people to the maximum extreme. So what we did was this is the brain framework. And we brought Scott in after we did the leadership team to say, okay, let's step through that entire process. And this is the process that we uh, developed with Scott because it's, it's just something that relates to our mission. Uh, it's five steps. You can do this big or small, you can do a big multidisciplinary team, or this is also something that we've got set up that way anybody in their day-to-day -day work can use this framework. It's, it's not rocket science. It's just really good fundamental step-by-step -step processing. So the first step is the B, right? The, the build the business case. Why do we even want to look at these processes? 
Um, because before you touch a process, you really wanna understand what is the process? What's the scope? Um, I can tell you scope is oftentimes a challenge to determine that when you got a process that goes across multiple groups. Um, but then why are we, are we gonna prove this and what do we expect from it? You know, if we're gonna spend all this time and energy and resources, you wanna make sure there's a return that's gonna help your organization. And so that's the first step in any of this process, set the scope and, and determine why you're gonna to touch it. The second step in the process is the R, the review of the current process. Uh, if I told you all the five steps, which one's the most important after going through this a couple of times, the R is, is, is the important step. Uh, you know, a lot of times what you're gonna find is people are gonna say, oh, I know what we need to do, right? We, we jump to solutions and invariably you jump to the solution, yeah, it might help, but it didn't hit everything. Then you find out, oh, it's not really working out the way we want. Well, the review of the current process is to go through that process, start to finish, step by step, just lay it out. Um, I'll show you a, a diagram here on the next slide, but don't, uh, we'll, we'll hold those slides for a second. Um, and, and really, uh, you'll, you'll find when you do that, it is time, it takes time. But if you do it well, there are a lot of benefits to doing that. It, it, it really develops the understanding, especially when you're talking about processes that cross teams uh, around what actually occurs and when, and what are the pain points. Uh, you can use, you'll, lean, you'll hear the term uh, defects or waste. We, we like the term pain points. I think it's just a little bit easier to, it's just more fun to say. Um, and so that's where you, you really identify all that opportunity. Now, sometimes it's a little overwhelming. Uh, in our inpatient admission process, we identified, I think it was around 75 pain points. Um, so that's where the next phase comes in. You know, what do you do with, when you got 75 pain points and everybody's saying, we need help, we need help, what are we doing? Uh, this A step is where you take that and you, you start looking for those themes, right? What, where are the opportunities? Which ones can we have a, a quick win on, right? Some of them we could fix on the spot in the room while others are gonna take a substantial change in our electronic health record. So you have to kind of do some analysis to figure out where, where do you go with your, your, your resources? Um, and, and I is the next step where everybody enjoys it, right? Okay, once you kind of know what the themes are, you can really kind of say, okay, you know, what do we want to do to, to improve the situation? Um, and so that's where you, you kind of allow the team, who are the experts, right? I, it wasn't me, it wasn't Scott, it was the team that was doing the work who know the situations to kind of come up with the ideas that we want to really focus in on and, and really drive to say, okay, we think this is going to solve the problem for everyone, not just our team. Um, and make it a collaborative effort. And lastly, uh, whenever you make a change, uh, you really want to see it through. Uh, the neutralized backslide is, is, is a critical component here. You know, a lot of times you make a change, you look at 60, 90 days, is it still in place? Is it, is it effective? Did it achieve what you expected? Um, I think that's where you know, we, we set up some regular meetings uh, after we got out of our Kaizen event with Scott. And we said every week we're gonna to touch base for, it was about 90 days. And we really said, okay, what, what's going on? Have we made all the changes? And for the changes that we didn't get done in the room, we just made sure that we were continually making the progress to the goals um, and the changes that we needed. And then at the end, we were able to say, look back and say, here's all the wonderful accomplishments we have. We did find some that we were not able to achieve. So we have those on a separate list to say, you know what? These may be stuff we want to address down the road, but just today with the resources and time we had available, we, we weren't able to get to it. So this is the framework that we've been using. And, and actually uh, we are currently in our third project. Um, we started uh, with our inpatient one last year, or late spring, early summer. Um, and I think what folks are finding is that, you know, it's easy to use and we're able to repeat it in other areas and we're kind of, you know, getting more acclimated to it. The next slide, please. So this is the A3. If you're familiar with A3, it's actually a paper size. Um, but this is really a great visual of the story of that brain framework in, in action. Uh, in the top left here, you know, you'll see there's the build the business case and the, and the review the current process. And this is where you, you, you lay it out and you say, well, what is that problem? And we said, well, we wanna look at the process from referral of a, a new potential admission to the time they're head in bed. And if you think about head in bed, what does that mean? Uh, the group had to define that. To our nursing staff, it meant they had to have their 
physical you know presence in the bed but then they also had to have all their orders from the physicians they had to have all the medications set up at the pharmacy so that way they knew that you know when nursing was there that night after they were admitted everything was going to you know they knew what to do for the care of the person but to our therapies team that meant they had to have their evaluations done and try to get you know all their plans of care set up but sometimes what was happening is everybody was trying to fight over getting to the person served so there's a lot of that you know you got to kind of define where, where your scope goes and how how far are you going to go with that process um so this is the orange little or excuse me not the orange the the, the purple pinkish kind of uh sticky note up there is the problem statement that the group defined that kind of outlined our scope and what we were trying to achieve and then right below that is one of the flow maps. This is actually the process start to finish. And each box represents. And what we did was um, the, the steps really, you know, we went through a high level to try and get the process. And what we found is that we had a lot of confusion in some areas. We had some dumpster fires is what we called them. And they really kind of said, you know, highlighted where did we need to focus in on clarity, coordination among the different teams. And I think that's where, um, you know, this really brings together the group if you do it right and you spend the time here. Uh, some people were getting impatient. Um, we did hear some feedback that it took a little long, but I think in the end, people realized the benefit was doing this process. And if you look at the little highlights, the yellow and the red, uh, what that was, those were the pain points and the ideas that we had come up with as we talked through the process. So that really set us up for the rest of the work when we had that. Um, once we had kind of gone through that process, and I, I will tell you, this diagram probably took us what was a day, like a day and a half, almost two, to really do it right uh, out of the fours that four days that we had set aside. Um, it does take time, but it is well worth it. From there, what we did is we collected all the pain points and the ideas, and we put them on each of a sticky note down here in the top left of this lower left quadrant under analyze causes and options. And we organized them into different categories. And this is where we started doing the analysis of them. What were our common themes? Did the problems areas that we were identifying on these sticky notes match what our expectations were? And they did, some areas, yes, they were, but there was other areas we uh, didn't have as many as we expected to have. So I think, you know, there was some surprises. Uh, when we talked about this admission process, we figured out equipment issues were bigger than we thought. There was a lot of, a, a a kind of a hidden one that you know people said well we have a hard time getting equipment for these new admissions which is delaying the head and bed so i think that's where this is just a great you know visual of kind of what we were doing and then uh we kind of identified three kind of subgroups to kind of really run with that first was that equipment and room assignment group to kind of tackle those issues but then we also identified you know we had some opportunities in the timeliness of making a decision um on terms of you know approving admission. So this is where we, we developed a, a new kind of methodology in terms of if a person served looked ideal for admission, why do we need to take them to the full committee? Let's just get the sign off and go on and spend time on admission, re reviewing potential admissions that may not be, you know, may have some more question marks we really want to take a deeper look at. And lastly, this is the process owner group. Uh, they had a lot of questions around processes and coordination, and they went through the process of outlining that you know, the steps and then who would do the steps. So what we came up with, and this is just a few of the examples up here in the top right of the of the artifacts that say, okay, here's what we're gonna do. The, the top diagram here is the color coded, you know, step-by-step -step process by which team was gonna take each step. And then we had uh, the, the admissions committee came up with a new flow chart on, you know, the quick ad admission decision process. And that's, you know, all the steps and who was going to be involved in which step so that way we can you know make that decision faster and then the last one the floor plan diagram is really where we said okay what information do we need around equipment and what's in each room so we know quickly you know where could we you know which room could we admit a person to so this is where we started with a floor plan that our case management team could quickly refer to and that um is is worked a lot better for them to know what what equipment's that where and which rooms are, are ideal for the person for we're not moving people around after the fact. And lastly here, this is the neutralized backslide. Uh, the, this is basically a kind of a project management perspective. If you think about you know, just having all your, your steps in the process, these are all the action items that we put onto a SharePoint list and, and we assigned who was responsible for uh, working them. And then we just kind of met with weekly to check in with them. So this is kind of the brain framework that we've used uh, for our inpatient, um, process and, and like I said we've used it for multiple 
other areas now and it's working well. And if you go to the next slide, the last one. Um, so where are we going? Uh, while Scott came and get it, got us off the ground, uh, these are big projects that we've taken on scope-wise to start with. Um, what we've done is we've kind of been watching those who gravitate to the lean work and who, who enjoy it. Um, because uh, like many of you, you know, in smaller organizations, we wear multiple hats. So what we're trying to do is just find those folks that can really, you know, give us a little bit more, uh, mm, hey, I like this and, you know, help us lead some of these work groups. Um, but also make sure that the work groups are not huge multidisciplinary. Let's let's push lean to the front line and help the staff make the changes at the front line as they do their work on a day to day basis. And so that's where we want to get to. We're, we're kind of moving our culture from big lean events to more of a continuous improvement focus. Um, and that way, it's not just you know one and done. I think there was a lot of concern when we first started about the one and done, and we're not doing that. Um, I'm, and I think what we're seeing is we're kind of getting a little bit of momentum. You know, when people see that a change can be made, they ask for more changes that will help them and others. And it's just kind of, you know, growing on that. And lastly, we're, we're really kind of working towards, okay, you know, when you start with Island of Life, we want you to kind of have that same level set with Lean, uh, same mindset that, you know, you know, if something's not working well, we want to know about it and we want to address it. Uh, so that's where we're really doing, you know, training with our new hires. Um, and that way, you know, they know what we're expecting from them. So that way, if you have an idea, bring it forward. Um, because what you'll find is your, your employees have the knowledge and the ideas. We just have to kind of tap into that. So that's a, a, a kind of the overview of where we've been with our journey um, with you using the grant and, and really kind of, you know, implementing lean to kind of improve our performance of an organization. Thank you so much, Joe and, and Scott. I appreciate kind of the the application of some of the theory that Scott outlined at the beginning and concepts and frameworks. We're going to move into the second half of our session. So um, I'm going to give a little bit of time for folks to indicate if they'd like to participate in a breakout room. Um, you can, um, I think Barb might ha uh, stop this uh, share, screen share so that you can select your room if you would like to be in dynamics of change and just talk about what that looks like for your organization with a few peers you can choose that option and then we have like kind of an open thread uh, option just giving folks a chance to connect and then i wanted to stay i know at nine o'clock a lot of folks have to drop to get to new meetings but um to open up the floor in this main room for questions of joe and scott and while folks are getting kind of zoomed out um, we will continue to record this Q&A. So if you want to participate and prioritize conversation, feel free to do that. Um, you'll be able to revisit this content. Um, but I wanted to maybe while they're zooming out, ask you a question around, you mentioned the Kaizen event. Um, can you explain a little bit more about what that uh, looked like? Um, and that's a little, that's a terminology I'm not familiar with. Great, great, great question. Uh, the Kaizen event is, usually a large scale event that you take intense study of, of a process. So what we did when we say Kaizen is we took four days and we got all the participants who are involved with the admissions process in a room. And we basically just said, okay, we need you all to kind of go through this process, start to finish and step through the brain framework. Um, to really kind of get focus on that, the, the Kaizen, we actually uh, blocked people's schedule. Uh, we got some pushback. I will tell you, you know, you think about four days out of anybody's schedule. It's In the middle of a pandemic, when, it, yes. <laughs> when you're stretched, that's incredible. <laughs> uh, and and we, we had great leadership support. Jean, our CEO, she's really championed this. And so she really pushed our areas to say, you know, this is that important to us. I mean, when you think about small organizations and, and sustainability, this is critical. And so what we did was we worked with ways to find scheduling options that would work with each of our areas from therapy to case management. But we also made sure we had the support services uh, that we needed. So we needed our EHR uh, expert. Uh, we also had a couple that, you know, were there from, you know, frontline nursing because, you know, while they may not be, uh, you know, doing the admissions work, you know, they saw the result of it. We also had our facilities because those were important in turning over our rooms for cleaning purposes. So we got all, we identified that, that group of stakeholders and we've got them in the room and we came through and just kind of worked through the process till we actually implemented some changes in the room. 
And then we, we had the list of action items at the end of the four days where we said, okay, this is what we want to accomplish here after, as a result of all this work. So that's what we did with the Kaizen event. Scott, do you have any kind of insights what you were? I, and think of it, I think really how I would think of it is it's really to take whatever improvement methodology you select and you say, we're going to have this group of people. And that group of people could be three, it could be eight, anything in between. And we're just going to focus on this one thing, whatever that one thing is. How do we, how do we, uh, when I think of nonprofits, I think, huh, how do we track and document and report our outcomes to our funders? <laughs> how do we do that better? And then we're going to walk through that framework solely focused on that thing. And you can do it across four days. You could say, hey, we're going to meet two hours or an hour every Tuesday for the next five weeks and just walk through it. So it, it can be really focused, you know, in a short window of time, or it could be, we're going to do this over the course of time. And my advice to people is like, pick one thing and just start. You don't have to worry about it being perfect or saying, oh, we have to have this beautiful, lovely framework that we have to, no, just start. What do you want to make better? And why is that important to make better? And take the time to look at the process like Joe talked about. What what are you doing today and what's not working? Where are the dumpster fires? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Owning and identifying those dumpster <laughs> fires. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, I, I posted in the chat, but I do want to encourage the smart people in our circle to come off mute, turn on your video, ask questions, pop them in the chat. Y'all know I can talk to our presenters uh, myself, but I think it's more fun when we hear your voices. <laughs> um, you, uh, you mentioned just start. Uh, my question as we kind of wait for other ones to get through, um, what are those important questions to ask at mm. the very beginning to yeah. identify, even identify what's a dumpster fire or a pain point or yep. um, what needs to be maybe the first thing that you uh, lean into? Mm -hmm. I think when you, when you, my advice, and I know we talked about this, this difference between performance improvement and performance excellence. If you know, hey, I absolutely want to go down one path or the other, neither of them are wrong. Okay, pick whatever path. Then just step back and depending on your path, I, I usually say, what keeps you up at night? I was on a client call uh, Monday and they're like, well, where do we start? And there's just so much and we can do this, 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 this. And I'm like, oh, time out, hold on. What keeps you up at night? What's the thing when you wake up in the morning or you have, you take a moment to think and you're like, oh, I am worried about fill in the blank. Start there. Yeah. Or once, I mean, that to me is that I believe is the easiest place to go. Because even if you pick maybe not the most or the highest priority thing, it's going to make an impact. Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a question in the chat from Ryan. Any advice on incorporating mm. persons served, clients, yeah. audiences in this process, surveys, I, many focus groups? I love that. Capturing, so Ryan, that is such an important question. Capturing the voice, I call it the voice of the customer, whether that's the voice of the person served, or the stakeholder, or whatever terminology we need to be patient, because like, all, all of that will change depending on the sector you're in. It's really, I think there's two ways to do it. One, well, maybe three. You could do surveys or focus groups. That makes sense. I love the idea if you can, I actually am doing one with a, a client in June. They actually have um, their funder and a customer is part of the event we're doing for four days. Which means that, man, they are gonna open the kimono. <laughs> <laughs> during this to say, okay, here it is. Here's all our, here's all the facts, um, which can be scary to say, wow, I'm really going to pull back the covers and someone's going to see some of the, some of the dust bunnies that are over in the corner. Um, 
The other way to do it is you say, okay, we're going to do this, whether you do it in focused or you're going to do it, um, you know, a day a week for the next whatever. You just you could just say, hey, um, it's probably more closely aligned with a focus group. Um, I'm just going to pick, and we're just going to call them, and we're going to divide and conquer. And Ryan, you're going to talk to these three people, and I'm going to talk to those two, and Joe's going to talk to these. And here's this list of questions we're just going to ask. Um, the other way is there's a methodology called journey mapping, which is a whole nother longer conversation. Um, but it actually is a is a way you can it, you people take a survey and you can actually map their experience across their journey with you, how they picked you, what was the experience like, was it positive or negative? There's an emotional item to that and if you you could if you do one or two you can actually compare group a to group b which is then going to say oh they have a hard time finding information oh when they first started with us this was a pain point and that may then help us focus where we and there is now a methodology to do that really really low cost okay Car companies have done it for years and they would spend 20 or 30 grand to do one. You can do it for a fraction of that cost now. So great question, Ryan. Yeah. yeah and, and anything I'll, else, Ryan? Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to just add in there, you know, one, one of the things we've done with some of ours is, you know, when we've kind of gotten through that process of, you know, developing solutions, you know, we actually went and took some of those solutions out to some of our customers and said, okay, how does this work for you all? In that way, we were able to get the feedback before we put it into practice. And I, and I know, you know, you think about just time commitments and they may not be able to sit on the committee and, and do all that. You know, that was another way that we kind of went at it just because, you know, you're right. There's too many people that you want to kind of get that feedback from. So we just threw it in as our follow up yeah. before we said it was implemented. Yeah. And, that, and that's a great way to get the feedback or pilot it with a group and just say, hey, how is this working? Give us some feedback. Hey, this was awesome. This was terrible. I hated it, loved it, whatever that is. Yeah. Thank you. You know, I was thinking about as we return to normal, you know, we have a unique opportunity. It, it could be kind of stressful and it could add some work to our plates in the short yeah. term. But as we return back to normal here doing live theater, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a time to kick our own tires and to see what the uh, ticket buyer experience is, see what the audience member experience is and, and track it. And so thanks for that, that yeah. advice and that guidance. Thanks, Ryan. I haven't seen other questions come through the chat yet. So please feel free to unmute or ask them. I have an interim question. Um, you know, resistance was something that you talked about. Uh, this is a, a lot, it sounds like for, for folks and it changes hard. Um, and so I guess, um, how do you address some of that like emotional element of doing this process work. We're, we're in the nonprofit sector. We're, we're empaths and <laughs> emotional people, a lot of us. I'm, I'm chuckling, Joe. I'm chuckling about the, I was totally thinking that slide that, that we had. Yeah. Um, go, I'll let you answer, Joe. <laughs> well, here, I'll re share my screen if that's all right, and I can pull up that slide. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You know, yeah. there, there, there's a couple of ways when you do this uh, that you can really help engage people. First is quick wins, right? Uh, when you do the quick wins, you get people on board faster. Now, that's not going to get everybody on board um, because, you know, there's always going to be somebody who, you know, is like, yeah, that just doesn't seem right. Um, okay, let me... So Cam is, uh, I love Cam, and she is one of those folks that she asked a lot of questions and she, she, she was real skeptical of the process when we were in the room. And, you know, one of the things that we found out, and this is something I've actually had follow-up conversations with her afterwards, and I asked, you know, she, she kind of started sharing a little bit more. She's like, what I was worried about was I had a process that worked for me. And she was so worried about losing that with all these changes that all of a sudden she was going to have a, her workload was going to increase. 
And it was just that, that confidence just to see that things improved. And, and I think what happened is when she saw that, you know, the processes were working for everybody, it got easier for her to, to kind of say, yeah, I can buy into that. Um, one of her concerns, and, and, and we actually named our award that we, we now use uh, to recognize team members at the end is called the Special Sauce Award. And the Special Sauce Award is really keeping that personal touch, right, with our person served. And, and so we've had to really kind of, you know, keep people, you know, honest on that when we're thinking about, okay, well, can we just automate all of this and not lose that personal connection? And so I think there's been a little bit of that pushback with Cam to say, you know, we need that connection. So, you know, it wasn't like we won over day one. Uh, she had whiteboards that she did not give up for a long time, but now she has actually given them up because what she's seen is her workflow improved. Her, her, her co-workers have gotten, you know, a lot, but, you know, their work lives have been improved. And mm -hmm. so began to really enable them to be better able to connect versus mm -hmm. having more work in the HR. Yeah. I've heard something over the course of this pandemic was people don't fear change, they fear loss. Mm. And like, to me, I think that there could be a sense of loss of whiteboards, <laughs> of, of, owner, of ownership of a process or, or whatever. So I did have a really great question from Alicia in the chat. Um, and so th thank you for that. That's a great example. Um, uh, the question is hearing more about the role of the board versus the role of the staff when going through this process. So it sounds like for On With Life, this was primarily a staff driven initiative or am, I could be wrong. Tell me more. <laughs> well, really what this is, is uh, this is a sustainability of On With Life, right? We want On With Life to be here for the next 30 plus years. And so, you know, what our CEO and the board has said is, you know, how do you make yourself sustainable? Because, uh, you know, what they would see is you would see more FTE asked to, you know, take on the increased demands. And we're like, you know, that is not a sustainable model. So, you know, it's been a lot of support from that upper, you know, senior leadership to say, you know what, we have to make this change in order to be here because we all want to continue to provide this service. So, you know, it really created that burning platform for us to say, you know, that's what our end goal is in this work. And I think what we've kind of found is, you know, while that's the burning platform, everybody's work life gets improved. And then they're, oh, okay, so this is why we really want to do it. You know, that's, that's making, you know, the staff happy and, and, and more engaged, but it, it, it's really started at the top level for us. Yeah. And I, I think it really, it's just a, it kind of depends. So is the board pushing to be more sustainable or to be better or whatever that is? I would then say, well, it probably makes sense that the board would be involved um, in either guiding, helping select, do we do improvement or excellence or both, right? We dabble in both. Some people on your board might be experts in this and you could lean on them to support the organization to do that. That's a great point. I love that. When I've been thinking about this, I even have had somebody approach me around pro bono work or yep. uh, skilled um, skilled volunteerism from a corporate yep. perspective. And this process is so ingrained in a lot of co corporate yes. cultures. And so being able to leverage that community expertise, um, if you're not able to work with, uh, you know, someone who's paid to help you gu guide you can be mm -hmm. um, a strategy. And yep. I know, Scott, when we were talking a while back around um, organizational excellence and um, the, the people piece of this work, you have um, you have a platform. Um, I don't know the right word to use around um, to, uh, like a, a can you talk a little bit more about the understand the tool that you use to help understand what kind yeah. of a team yep. that you're working with because um, that I think is also really relevant at the board level as well as the staff level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so. As you go forward, one of the most impactful things you can do is to understand who are you working with? Well, I'd say there's two kind of lenses that we want to look at. One is who are you and, and your, your individual self-awareness and self-awareness is important to understand um, who you are 
and how who you are impacts others. Number one. Number two then is, okay, that team working together, where are their abilities? So there is, you can use what, what I would term people data through, through doing some assessments. Um, they're super quick. Brianne, how long did it take you to take? It was bananas. It was like two yeah. minutes. Okay. And, and how accurate was it? It was highly accurate okay. in my perspective. Yeah. And, and what, what that can do for you is then you can lean on, I say lean on, you can empower, you can engage individuals in, in certain ways. So like, for example, I'm highly innovative. That is what my kind of pattern represents, which means I should be really put in a place to think of ideas, options, how could we work? Um, what I'm not good at, and this may surprise some people because I'm a process person, I'm really not good at the details, operationalizing them. But I know that Joe is, which means, yeah, let's think of ideas and then let's bounce that off of Joe to say, okay, these are the roadblocks of why this maybe wouldn't work because it's going to be hard to operationalize. But if we just tweaked it a little bit and then Joe can run. Now, notice Joe built this really beautiful SharePoint thing for On With Life where we could track all the stuff. And, you know, I, I would probably, if I had my way, I would just write that on Post-it notes. Now, I don't like to admit that publicly. Consultants and post-it note stock, I think. Uh, yeah, we actually yeah. just transitioned to SharePoint. So it's interesting to see the ways that other organizations yeah. are using it. There's, and, there's some great tools out there. And so understanding that makeup of that team can be really important because we're going to find out well. And I just think of like um, uh, Sunny, one of the people, and uh, this is great that it's recording. So now uh, all of this will be a, a record somewhere someone can see. So I think of like Sunny was very chipper, happy. She's going to bring the team together. We had others who were skeptics who were like, mm, I don't know. And the more I understand them and understand the people aspect of this, because really, performance excellence or performance improvement is really, I usually draw it as, as a Venn diagram, right? Two circles overlapped. One side, you have the tools and, and methodologies that you use. One side is the people. The sweet spot is, the, is where they overlap. I can't do it without people. And I think I told Joe and Gene that, uh, you know, when we were gonna do this event, I, I think I said something like, Oh, somewhere around noon, the first day, people are not going to be happy because we're playing in their sandbox. We're, we're uncovering the things that they're like, you know, my favorite quote from, from when we did the event at On With Life, and I would say this, something like this almost always happens. Until I said it out loud, I didn't know how crazy what I was doing was. So they explain, here's what I do. And then I write it down and then I type it in and then I print it out. And then I take that form and I write more and then I type it out. And then in the same sentence, she's like, I had no idea how crazy it was until I said it out loud. And to me, that's the moment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm looking at the question from Ted. Yep. That's a big question. And Joe, we did. Yeah. Um, what we found was we had a little bit of that. We're in the room. People kind of just were... for the recording, I'm gonna voice the question so Great. that uh we have the context. Um, when collaborating with multiple departments and stakeholders to come to a consensus, did you ever have an individual that you realized wasn't willing to change or maybe was the problem themselves? So thanks. Go ahead, Joe. Yep. So yes, great question, Ted. Yes, we did. Uh, I know right after Scott left, uh, right in our weekly meetings, we started getting some pushback. And, and it, was, it was fair pushback. I, I expected some of that. Um, one of the things that we did is, you know, if we, we challenged the group in those calls to say, you know, why can't you make the change? That was the first line of approach. And, 
you know, sometimes that could work them through because what we have found is sometimes you have to break their current assumptions of what has to happen in order to allow them to kind of see a change. So, so some people we were able to just push on the call and, and I pushed on people hard. It, you know, um, Scott did it in the room. And, you know, what I found was, you know, sometimes when we got a few people to, to realize, oh, we don't have to do it the way we think we do. Um, that opened up some of those folks. There were still some folks that, uh, not a lot, I, I would say one or two in particular that even when we pushed back, they just kind of, you know, melded like, okay, yeah, whatever. And, and you could just kind of tell that they were still a little stomp. They're gonna hold, dig in a little bit more. And, and so one of the things that I did is I, I had a lot of side conversations with leadership, right? Their leadership needs to be their cheerleaders. It's not me, it's not my process. I don't own anything in terms of their workload. And so there were a lot of side conversations about leadership going to work with those individuals say, you know, we, we've got to do something different. And, and you know, I hear you if you, you've got concerns, but we've got to move beyond. And so that's kind of the two approaches that we use with our inpatient process to really help with those folks. Um, and that, that was why I would say our project uh, with our top leadership support went from good to great. It was because of that support that those leadership, when I went to them and I said, here's what's going on, they were willing to kind of go have those crucial conversations. And the piece I would add to that, a couple things. Um, we established ground rules at the beginning about how we would interact, how we would, how we would kind of go forward. And there's an important differentiation that we have to make. Consensus is not unanimous. So when we make consensus, it's really saying, hey, can we agree in this room? And you may disagree in the room, that's fine. Outside, when you walk out the room, you are united with that direction. That is really consensus. So, and, and sometimes people say, well, no, we, we, we didn't all agree. I don't expect us all to agree. Is it a net forward and can we support it outside the room? Mm -hmm. And then the second part is we have to remind if, if you have Siri and you wanna play, ask Siri the definition of opinion and what Siri will tell you in, in whatever voice you have chosen for your device <laughs> um, is an opinion is a perspective not based on fact or knowledge. <laughs> And so what's important is if we're going to go a direction, we need to at least try it. And if we have data that says, ooh, this is not good, which, and that data can be numbers that could be, oh, that experience was terrible. Then yeah, we absolutely should change. But until we have that data, we have agreed we're going to stop this direction. Mm -hmm. And we're stopping this direction because of this. Um, there's a, a little facilitation tool that I picked up and we have only about three minutes left. Um, and this was from one of the folks who'd worked with you. So I don't know if I'm going to do this right, or even you, you correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong, but it's the fist to five. Fist to five. Yep. Can you, can you share a little <laughs> bit about that tool yeah, yeah, um, fist, for yeah. consensus? Yep. Fist of five for consensus is you do rock, paper, scissors. And then when you do that, everyone holds up some number of fingers, one to five. Five is like, I'm totally in, I totally support it. One is, mm, no, I don't know. And I always have to remind people, this is the finger you use for one, okay? <laughs> uh, that is important to remember. And what you're looking for is if we all say fours and fives, we're good, let's go. If we have, oh, you know, most of us are saying four or five, but we have a couple twos, then we just need to talk about, okay, what are you thinking? Mm-hmm. Hey, mm -hmm. I, saw, I saw. You're not going to necessarily get all fives. No. But, mm -hmm. Yeah, and 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 not. It's it's just really quick. It's mm -hmm. just like okay, fist to five. Boop boop boop. What are you thinking? And and it, actually, it's really easy to do on Zoom or Teams because we can just do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, um, I think we can kind of start to wrap up under that. Uh, that was a. a, a helpful little takeaway uh, for folks, I hope, um, in the midst of this kind of a meaty conversation <laughs> about what it means to, to work towards improvement and to be better as organizations. Um, so I just wanted to share my appreciation for you, Joe and Scott, and um, our uh, appreciation for being able to support this work as part of our adaptation grant program. And, um, you know, I think uh, 
both of you would probably be open to connecting with folks who've been on the call. Sure. Um, and so if people need to be connected, I'm happy to make that uh, introduction or, um, you know, just send me questions, thoughts, and uh, really looking forward to hearing more about where On With Life goes. I know you guys have a huge vision for the future and hopefully this will help you get there sustainably. Thank All right. Well, we'll be back with Community Circles on April 7th, and I believe that our topic there will be a little bit of a hodgepodge, perhaps, <laughs> but um, I'm excited. BKD is going to give us some tips on uh, remote work environment audits, uh, the, uh, the fun experience of that, and then we'll probably talk a little bit about uh, you know, some more donor relations uh, strategies as well. So thank you so much for spending time with us this morning, and hope to see you next month.